Well, hello, everybody. My mic is unmuted now, and you'll be able to hear me. Uh, if you're having any troubles tonight during our live stream, make sure you comment in the section, in the comment section, so that I know there's an issue, and I will try to fix it the best I can. Well, I want to welcome you tonight and to welcome you to our uh, online Bible study. We're going to do something a little bit different tonight than what we've done in the past, and... Um, there's a couple reasons for that. First of all, I have been working at uh, getting a special guest to come on with me uh, for an online Bible study and discussion. And unfortunately, the timing never worked out and we were unable to do it this week. But uh, I'm looking forward maybe in the coming weeks or possibly in the fall having this guest with me. And this is an individual who teaches at Tyndale and other uh, institutions and uh, has a unique perspective on indigenous culture. And of course, that's a very important topic today. A lot of people are talking about residential schools, the church, indigenous culture, and the indigenous expressions of Christianity. So um, I invited this individual and we're trying to work on a plan. So hopefully we can get something figured out. But uh, stay tuned for that. But this evening, as we prepare 
uh, for in a couple of days for Canada Day and to celebrate our country. Uh, there's a lot of things in our country we can celebrate. And there's also a lot of things that cause us to reflect and recognize that we need to correct some things from our past. Not everything has been wonderful. And as Canadians, we have made mistakes as a culture and as a people. And, uh, and so many people this year are wondering whether they're going to celebrate Canada Day. I know that there are some uh, places uh, who are not communities and cities and such who are not celebrating any way to uh, remember uh, what has happened in our history regarding the indigenous people and residential schools. And I'm not going to get into that debate tonight. But what I am want to talk about is uh, a unique perspective of something we can celebrate as Canadians. And I want to uh, just share with you, I'll put it here on the screen, uh, Canadian Pentecostal history. I love history. I, it's one of us, a subject I've always enjoyed reading about, a subject I've always enjoyed learning about, and especially when it comes to the Pentecostal movement and the Pentecostal church in Canada and in Newfoundland. Uh, of course, Calvary Church is a Pentecostal church associated with, with the Pentecostal Assemblies of Newfoundland and Labrador. And uh, we have lots of history. Our denomination here in Newfoundland has been around for over 100 years. And lots of history, lots of people, lots of pictures, lots of stories and books, and, and uh, lots of things to talk about. But I want to take tonight and a moment for us to examine, because we have such a rich history and heritage in the Pentecostal movement. And Canada has played a very important role and an important part of the Pentecostal movement, not only in Canada, but in North America and around our world. So this evening, uh, for a little while, I just want to share with you um, some history and some individuals and some ministry couples that I think are extremely influential when it comes to the Pentecostal movement. And uh, they're Canadians or became Canadians, are ministered in Canada, and the work of their hands and the labor they put into it and the time and dedication and most importantly the calling and anointing of the holy spirit has last has given lasting impact and has made an impact still today and so we're going to take some time and now i will say from the very beginning uh, maybe there's someone watching here that's an expert in pentecostal history i do not claim to be an expert i know that i will not be able to give the whole scope of things and even the individuals I touch on in the session tonight, it, it won't be thorough in every sense. There might be some things I might not say or do not know. And uh, so I don't claim to have all the knowledge, but I do want to share with you things that I do know about our heritage as Pentecostals and as Christians in Canada and the influence that Canadians have made. And it's been pretty incredible. And so just so you're aware, I've, I've been working on this. I got this book here, uh, Azusa Street by Frank Bartleman. Uh, I have these books by Burton Janes about Sister Garrigus who came to Newfoundland, the lady who came and the lady who stayed, and also referencing this big, thick book in my office, which is the Dictionary of Pentecostal and Charismatic Movements, and lots of information. That's a worldwide thing. Also, my office got some works by A.S. Bercy, who was the General Superintendent of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Newfoundland uh, for several years, and uh, this one is his autobiography. This one here talks about uh, individuals that were pastors in the province that not many people may know. And so he wrote those books. And uh, also, of course, reading a book uh, by Steve Land. I'm using this one for one of my seminary courses. And this talks about Pentecostal heritage and history. So I want to take some time. I am hope it's not going to be boring. And I hope as you're going to enjoy. Make sure you comment or ask questions or leave a thought. And hopefully we'll learn and grow together. And so... What I want to do is, first of all, I want to pray, and then we're going to look at some scripture and then go into uh, our history lesson tonight and looking at our heritage. And this looking at our heritage, this looking back, is really designed to encourage us and to continue to push us forward. I'll never forget a few years ago, we had uh, a man named Carl Vader speak at our pastor's conference here in Newfoundland. And he, he referenced the fact that his grandfather was Eugene Vaders, who was uh, once the general superintendent of the Pentecostal Assemblies here, a very important and influential person. And he, and he said this, you don't honor our pioneers by doing what they did, but by thinking how they thought. 
And what he was making the point about is that our heritage and our history should encourage us and push us forward to what God is calling us to do today, what the spirit desires to do today. And we're going to see that some of these people we're going to look at tonight um, were innovators and really kind of pushed the envelope or really, really took risks for the message of the gospel. And we don't honor them tonight simply by doing the same things, although we can do the same things. But we honor them by thinking how they thought and being obedient and receptive to the spirit. And so we're going to pray together. We're going to read some scripture and then we are going to look at our heritage as Canadians and looking at five. There's many more. I have some honorable mentions at the end, but there are many more people we can reference. But just looking at five tonight of the Pentecostal movement. So let's pray together and then we will look into let's pray. Father, we thank you today for your loving kindness. And Lord, as we approach Canada Day. We, we think about our country and our nation and the people found within our borders. And God, we recognize your hand of mercy and your grace upon us. And, and Lord, we pray that you would keep our land glorious and free. But Father, we also recognize today the hurt that's been in our past and is very much in our present. We recognize that we need you and our country needs you so desperately. We need the power of the gospel. We need the hope of the resurrection. We need the peace of God that goes beyond our understanding. And so, Lord, tonight we pray for our country from coast to coast to coast. We pray for those living in our country. We pray that, God, your hand of favor would rest upon us. Lord, that you would give wise counsel to our government, that you would empower your churches with the power of the Holy Spirit, that we might be the salt and light that our nation needs today. We ask God as we go into the study that looking back at our past and looking at the influencers of yesterday may encourage us and challenge us and empower us by your power and might to be who you want the church in Canada to be today. We ask this now in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to look at uh, a couple scriptures tonight. And uh, just to kind of give some background, Pentecostal people and Pentecostal churches find their major identity and the major focus of their mission and, and the major focus of who they are and their origin in the book of Acts, specifically Acts chapter 2. And we're going to read some verses together about the day of Pentecost. And this is where the Pentecostal church gets its name from this experience that happened during the Jewish feast of Pentecost. And so let's read it together. Acts chapter 2. We're going to look at verse 1 to 6 and then verses 12 to 18. This is what the scriptures say. Now, when the day of Pentecost had come, they, they being the disciples and the believers, about 120 of them, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like a violent wind blowing came from heaven and filled the entire house where they were sitting. And tongues spreading out like a fire appeared to them and came to rest on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven residing in Jerusalem. When this sound occurred, a crowd, a crowd gathered and was in confusion because each one heard them speaking in their own language. All were astounded and greatly confused, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others jeered at the speakers, saying, They are drunk on new wine. But Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed them. You men of Judea and all of you who live in Jerusalem, know this and listen carefully to what I say. In spite of what you think, these men are not drunk, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. For this was that which was spoken through the prophet Joel. And this is an Old Testament prophet, an Old Testament prophecy that God had given about what he was going to do. He says, in the last days, it will be, God says, that I will pour out my spirit on all people and your sons and your daughters will prophesy and your young men will see visions 
and your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. The major verse for Pentecostals is Acts chapter 2, verse 4. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other languages as a spirit enabled them. This evening, I wanted to look at the ramifications and our history of this outpouring. You see, this occurred 40 or 50 days, sorry, after. Um, after uh, the crucifixion of Christ, after the Passover, after the resurrection, Jesus spent 40 days with his disciples. And then he said, listen, I'm going away, but wait here and you will receive the promise of the Father, the power of the Holy Spirit. And then they waited and prayed in an upper room for 10 days. And then the festival of Pentecost, the Spirit came and filled them with power and might. And they spoke in other languages or as some Bible translations say in other tongues. So the church went for many years operating in the gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit. We see in the book of Corinthians, first Corinthians, Paul has to bring some correction to the church because and this was about, let's say, probably 30 years, maybe even 40 years after uh, the, the day of Pentecost. He had to bring correction to the, the spiritual gifts because they were being misused and abused. They were in operation. But it seemed that over time, the spiritual gifts and the work of the Holy Spirit and the and filling and power of the Holy Spirit diminished. It was forgotten. And for a, thou, a thousand years, probably uh, 1,800 years, the, the gifts of the Spirit were ignored for reason and intellect and so many other things. But what we see is that in 1900s uh, in Chicago, and I'm sorry, Chicago, Los Angeles, Chicago comes in later. In Los Angeles, there was a small congregation of people who desired once again the power of God. For about 70 years or so, or even 100 years, there was a holiness movement happening where people were yearning and praying for more of God, and they wanted an experience with the Holy Spirit. And on January January 1st, 1901, we see that a young woman named Agnes Osmond received this gift of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in a language that she didn't learn, but that the Holy Spirit gave her. And this happened January 1st, 1901. And from that time forward, a movement began. But the movement really took off, and I would really say this was the birthplace or the cradle of the Pentecostal movement, Los Angeles, 1906. A small congregation of mixture of believers met together in an old building. This was once a church on top that was a barn on the bottom for the horses and carriages that was later then remodeled into a church. And let me make this a little bit bigger for you so you can see it a bit better. This building here off to the side, I don't know if you can see that there. This was called the Apostolic Faith Gospel Mission. And this was a group of believers who were desiring the power of the Holy Spirit. And this man right in the middle, this was their preacher. This was their pastor, William J. Seymour. He was a black man who was blind in one eye. And what's very interesting is, of course, during this time, the United States was very segregated. Whites and blacks and other nationalities, they never mixed together. And because Seymour was a black man, he actually had to do his Bible school courses in the hallway because he was not allowed to sit with the white students in his class. And so he would sit in the hallway and he would learn and grow. And he went to Los Angeles and he started preaching this message about Acts 2 and 4. That the Holy Spirit would come and fill us with power. And the evidence of this empowerment, one of the evidence was speaking in a language we did not know or understand. A language that only God could give. It was called speaking in tongues. And he preached this in a church in Los Angeles. And after that sermon, he left. And when he came back for the Sunday night sermon, they locked him out of the church. They didn't want anything to do with it. 
So he started a small prayer meeting and this prayer meeting then went into this church building and it became the apostolic faith gospel mission. And it was in this little building. And I mean, there's not much to look at. A very humble building. Uh, look, there's not, there's not even a front step. I, at one time, I guess there was a front step, but the main sanctuary became where the stable used to be. The Holy Spirit fell on 312 Azusa Street. And Pastor Julia actually had the opportunity to go to 312 Azusa Street a couple of years ago. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like this anymore. The building has since been torn down. But here began a Pentecostal movement and revival that lasted not three weeks, not three months, but three years, three years. And the Pentecostal movement went from Los Angeles and spread across Canada, United States and the rest of the world. And uh, I want you to take notice of something here. Here on the side, and hopefully you can see it. Oh, my mouse is moving over here. The Los Angeles Daily Times in on April the 18th, 1906, wrote a little small article about what was happening in this church. And you can see it there. They said, weird babble of tongues. New sect of fanatics is breaking loose. Wild scene last night on Azusa Street. Gurgle of wordless talks by his sister. And this article goes on to talk about how it was so fanatical and, and outlandish because uh, it wasn't like a regular church service. It wasn't something they expected. And what was even more outlandish and received lots of criticism was that blacks and whites and Hispanics, uh, men and women were all mixing together. No one was better than another. No one had better privilege than another. Everyone was being used and filled with the Holy Spirit. There wasn't very many instruments there. In the beginning, there were no instruments there. They simply came in and sang and let the Spirit lead them where they were going to go in the service. And sometimes the service would last hours and hours. Sometimes they would be in there all night until the next day. And this revival broke out and people were starting to be filled with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. This beginning group was criticized both by Christians, other Christians, and the community alike for being fanatical, what they called fanatical, because they believed in the operation of the gifts of the Spirit. They believed in tongues and interpretation. They believed in prophecy. They believed in divine healing. They believed in sanctification, that the Holy Spirit would purify them and take out that desire for them to sin. They, they were criticized for allowing everyone to worship together, regardless of their background or race or creed. They were criticized because both men and women could play a role in the church. And they were criticized because people from all classes, both poor and rich, from the right side of the tracks and the wrong side of the tracks, they all worship together. Now, admittedly, in the beginning, this was more a, a, a expression of faith for people who weren't accepted anywhere else. They weren't accepted in the fancy churches. They weren't accepted in the cathedral. So they went to Azusa Street and they found God. But from this little church, as you can see here, from this one-eyed black preacher preaching to men and women, blacks and whites and Latinos alike, everybody started a worldwide movement and a movement and a revival that would impact Canada. And again, I read earlier in Acts chapter 2, it says here that Peter stood up and said that this outpouring of the Holy Spirit was a fulfillment of what God had promised to the prophet Joel. When he said, I will pour out my spirit on all people, your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams, I, even on my servants, both men and women. And we see that from the very beginning, the Pentecostal movement was something called egalitarian, meaning that both men and women were called to preach the gospel. Both men and women could be pastors. It didn't matter if you were a man or a woman. You could be used by God in the Pentecostal movement. You could be used by God in the Holy Spirit because he was pouring out his spirit on all flesh, regardless of you're a man or a woman, regardless if you're black or white or another nationality, regardless if you had lots of money or no money, regardless if you were well educated or had no education, the Holy Spirit could fill you and use you for his glory. And this is what we see happen in Canada. 
Let's go to the next one. The first person I want to talk about, the first Canadian I want to talk about tonight in the Pentecostal movement was a gentleman named Robert Edward McAllister, affectionately known as R.E. McAllister. As you can see there, uh, this is from a picture from his younger days. This, of course, a picture when he was quite older. Uh, in 1906, this young man, R.E. McAllister, heard about the revival that was happening in Azu on Azusa Street in Los Angeles. And so he went there. He decided he was going to go to see what this was all about. And he went to this revival and went to this church in Los Angeles on Azusa Street. And there he heard the teaching of Acts chapter 2. And he was filled with the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. And many historians, not everyone, there's a bit of a debate on this, but many historians believe that R.E. McAllister was the very first Canadian to be filled with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Now, there's a lot of debate on that. Uh, we're going to talk about another ministry couple that the Holy Spirit filled separate from Azusa Street, had no connection to Azusa Street. Likewise, we hear uh, reports of Methodist churches and different churches in Canada who had outpourings of the Spirit in, in different times. But some scholars and some historians think that Ari McAllister was probably the first Canadian. I haven't decided where I've landed on that, but all I know is that he was one of the earlier Canadians to accept the Pentecostal message and to bring it back home. And so he, he was filled with the Holy Spirit at the Azusa Street meeting, and he went back to Canada. Now, fast forward a couple years in 1913, Ari McAllister was preaching at a camp meeting in California. And one of the things about the Pentecostal movement was that in the, in the early years is that this was all brand new. There were no textbooks like I have today. There, were, there was no large dictionary like I have today that I can reference and look at. A lot of them were, were formulating theology as they were going, and sometimes they got it right, sometimes they got it wrong. And at a camp meeting, Ari McAllister was preaching about um, water baptism and preaching about the importance of finding the true method of water baptism. Of course, we believe in immersion. The, we believe the Bible teaches Baptism by being submerged in water as a representation of dying with Christ in our sins and being risen with Christ in the resurrection, as opposed to infant baptism or other forms. And R. E. McAllister was preaching, and he and he started reflecting in the sermon about how uh, in Matthew 28, Jesus tells the disciples to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. But when you read the book of Acts, what we see is that the book on the book of Acts says they baptized in the name of Jesus. And so he kind of made a couple points about this. He was preaching about that and he was reflecting on it. And uh, one, one young preacher in the audience in the congregation that night was really stirred by that message. And uh, he, he uh, spent all night up reading the Bible fasting and praying and reading the Bible to just try to figure all this out. And, and early in the morning, he was, he ran through the camp as he was running past all the tents and places. He was running through the camp saying that he had a vision of the Lord and the Lord told him, the Lord Jesus told him that, uh, that baptism in Jesus name only was the proper way of baptism and, and not to worry about the father, son, and the Holy spirit that, that Jesus had told him there was no Trinity it, it was all the God here was just in him. It, it was Jesus only. And from that moment, there was a divide in the Pentecostal movement, thanks to this Canadian, Ari McAllister, and his sermon, that became called, it became the new issue. It's called the new issue, where so many Pentecostals rejected the theology and doctrine of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and they accepted something or they, they preached something called Jesus only, or oneness theology, that they believe that God the Father was in the Old Testament, Jesus the Son in the New Testament, and now Jesus the Holy Spirit in the work of the church. And uh, this was quite a big issue. It actually caused families to divide. It caused churches to split. It caused the global Pen uh, Pentecostal movement to really be divided. And so many became oneness Pentecostals, and, and uh, some of them include the, the United Pentecostal Church, UPC, or 
Jesus only, or what they call oneness, um, Pentecostals, and then it also left Trinitarian Pentecostals. And so uh, Calvary Pentecostal Church, we are a Trinitarian Pentecostal Church. We believe the Bible is clear, even though the word Trinity is not found in the New Testament. The Bible is clear from Genesis to Revelation that God is expressed in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And there are countless texts, there are countless references in the scripture that explain that. And I won't go into that tonight. But Ari McAllister was a oneness Pentecostal for a while. But in 1919, he heard a sermon or a series of sermons by a young woman, a young preacher named Amy Semple McPherson. She was a Canadian, and we're going to talk to you about her next. But he heard a sermon by Amy Semple McPherson. And after he listened to the sermon she preached about the Trinity and God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and what the scriptures teach, he recanted this. And went back to being a Trinitarian, believing that God is the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And uh, Ari McAllister went on to become a founding member of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada and was a very influential preacher and teacher and theologian in Canada and the United States. But it's very interesting that, that this Canadian preaching at a camp meeting uh made some statements, made some claims as he was working through his understanding of the scriptures that still today have caused a divide. Uh, I know that in my family, uh, of course, we're friendly and amicable. It's not a divide that we don't like each other, but there are some people in my family that are oneness Pentecostals. And of course, there are other people in my family that are Trinitarian Pentecostals. We still get along fine. We still go to family reunions. We still are Facebook friends. But it has created, created a divide. And still today, there is that division. Some Pentecostals believe in the oneness theology. And many more Pentecostals believe in the Trinitarian theology. And uh, there's a lot I can go into that, but I won't tonight. Just know that Ari McAllister, Robert Edward McAllister, was very influential in, uh, in the Pentecostal movement and was very influential and in causing this divide of which he later said, I was wrong. I need to go back to what the Bible teaches and regarding Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So let's move on to the next one. Enough of that controversy. Oh, more controversy. Here we go. You're going to realize that the Pentecostal movement has always been plagued with controversy, but power as well. We're going to look at Amy Semple McPherson. Here's a couple of pictures of uh, what she was called Sister Amy. And you can see here, here she is posing for a picture with her Bible. Here she is in a crusade. And I believe that's actually in her church that she started in Los Angeles. Amy Sample McPherson, um, then and still now, is a very interesting character, a very interesting individual in the Pentecostal movement. And she was Canadian. She was born on a small farm in Ontario. And her name was Amy Kennedy. And uh, she would actually be go on to become one of the world's best known Pentecostal evangelists and pioneers in the early Pentecostal movement. And uh, during the winter of 1907 and 1908, during that winter time, an Irish uh, evangelist, a Pentecostal evangelist named Robert Semple, he, he started holding services in the small community next to where she grew up. And she went to those services. She was raised in a Christian home. Her mother was a, a, a member of the Salvation Army. And of course, by virtue of being raised in that home, she was too. And she went to these revival meetings and she was saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. And she ended up marrying the evangelist, Robert Semple. And uh, after they got married, they uh, lived in Ontario for a little bit. They pastored a couple churches in Ontario and they ended up moving to Chicago. Remember I mentioned Chicago? The uh, Pentecostal movement kind of branched from Los Angeles to Chicago with a pastor named William Durham. And uh, he was teaching there, a very famous pastor in Chicago. And uh, they went to be under his ministry and join his ministry and travel with him as evangelists uh, with the Pentecostal message. And um, they traveled with him for a couple of years. And in 1910, uh, both Robert and Amy felt that God was calling them to China as missionaries. And so they packed up everything they had, all they had, sold the rest, and went to China in 1910. Amy was pregnant at the time, and they were believing that God was sending them there. Well, unfortunately, 
after only a few weeks of being in China, Robert Semple, Amy's husband, contracted malaria and he died. They buried him in China and Amy waited until her baby was born. She had a little girl. She named her Roberta and she waited till the baby was born and then she moved back home with her mom and dad and uh, she ended up going to New York with her parents and, and working with the Salvation Army in New York. And in New York, that's when she met a man named Harold McPherson and uh, they got married not long after that she got back from China and together they had a son. His name was Rolf, Ralph or Rolf <laughs> and uh, they began traveling the eastern United States and Canada as evangelists and holding special services and meetings. And, um, you know, it, it was it was a very powerful time. And, and, and she was a very powerful preacher and was able to draw in people into the gospel message like almost no one else before her. Unfortunately, again, I controversy. In 1921, she divorced her husband. Uh, I, according to the reports and according to what, what history books I have, the, the ministry and the stress of that became too much. And their marriage dissolved and it, it just went by the wayside and she became divorced. And uh, and she went off on her own then to minister. Now, uh, Amy or Sister Amy, as she's known, became a really well-known evangelist and uh, she, who was a pas she was a passionate preacher and she was very effective in communicating the gospel. And she preached revivals all around the world. She preached in Australia. She preached in Europe. She preached all in Canada and the United States. And in the early 1920s, uh, she started a church in Los Angeles. Again, Los Angeles is where the Pentecostal movement started in 1906. This is around the early 1920s. And she she started a church and it grew and it grew and it grew uh, until eventually they had to build a brand new big building. And so they actually built a five over a uh, 5,300 seat building, an auditorium, a huge sanctuary that could fit over 5,000 people. And they named it Angelus Temple. And as Pastor Julia says here, she's watching from home. She actually got to visit. Uh, a few years ago when she was in California for a, a conference, she got to visit the, ho the house that she had and also the church that she founded. And that church, Angelus Temple, is still in Los Angeles today. The same building, the same sanctuary, different pastors, of course, now. But she started that church and it is still around today. Now, uh, to her congregation and to the city of Los Angeles, like I said before, she became known as simply as Sister Amy. And, and Sister Amy was a radical and a pioneer in so many different ways. Uh, let me just explain a few. Um, she was the very first person in, very first woman, sorry, in the United States and in Canada to receive a license to operate a radio station. In 1924, she was the very first woman ever to receive a license to have a radio station so that she could preach on the radio and put hymns and gospel music on the radio and Christian programming on the radio. Um, and that radio station is still active today. Um, she recognized very early on the need for men and women who felt that God was calling them to ministry and uh, but they never had any formal training. She recognized the need of training and preparing pastors for ministry. So she established a Bible college. She called it the Lighthouse for International Foursquare Evangelism and uh, Life College, L-I-F-E, Bible College. And she established that. And uh, even though throughout her time as a pastor and evangelist early on, she was part of the Salvation Army. And for a little while, she was associated with the Assemblies of God and, and different Pentecostal denominations. She was kind of everywhere. In 1927, she formally began her own Pentecostal denomination. And she called it the International Church of the Four Square Gospel. Now, Four Square Gospel is this. Jesus as Savior, Healer, Baptizer, and Coming King. Many Pentecostal churches at that time were fivefold. Jesus as Savior, Sanct Healer, Sanctifier, Baptizer, and Coming King. But she preached a four-square gospel. Jesus as Savior, Healer, Baptizer, and Coming King. And so she started her very own denomination. And she planted lots of churches. And her denomination grew. And people became part of it. And uh, do you know that worship song? 
majesty, worship his majesty. Unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise. We love singing that worship song. Well, that was written by a man, uh, Dr. Jack Hayford, and he's a very smart Pentecostal theologian, and he is actually a member of the denomination that Sister Amy started, the Foursquare Movement. He was a member of that, and the Foursquare Church is actually active in Canada. There, there are Foursquare Churches in Canada. I don't think there are any in Newfoundland, but definitely in the Maritimes and in the main part of mainland of Canada, there are um, Foursquare Churches. What's also really interesting about Sister Amy, and there's lots to say, and I won't try, won't, <laughs> try not to be too long tonight, but... Um, she was also forward thinking. And so she actually set up a social service system out of her church. And during the Great Depression, remember, this was a late a 1920s, early 1930s, a huge depression came across um, America and Canada. And, and the economic system was wiped and people lost all their life savings overnight and went from being you know, middle class or well to do or having enough money to basically being poor like that, having nothing, not even food to eat. And her church took it upon themselves in Los Angeles to feed people every single day. And the historians estimate that over the time of the Great Depression, the church that she founded and she was leading as a Pentecostal Canadian woman fed over 1.5 million people during the Great Depression. Uh, Sister Amy was known for hosting healing services and many miracles were performed in her serv services uh, all the glory to God in that. And the Lord used her in a mighty way. But uh, what's very interesting is that God uses imperfect people. I want to make that clear. The very first two we talked about, Ari McAllister got his theology messed up and made a mess of it. And, and later had to recant of that. And, and his choices and decisions are still in effect today. Amy Semple McPherson had a very complicated personal life. Of course, her first husband died as a missionary shortly after they arrived in China. Uh, her second husband and herself, they divorced, and, that, and that's a big deal. And and um, and so her, her personal life and ministry life became pretty complicated. She was actually criticized an awful lot for being very flamboyant, and she, she would host these major services and put all these resources and energy uh, of making these services very appealing and people from Hollywood directors and the Hollywood elite would come to Los Angeles and they would sit in her gospel services because she would do such a unique presentation of the gospel and they would get inspiration for Hollywood movies by watching this woman do a cantata or a pageant in her church and, and present the gospel. And in 1926, she was really thrust to fame or infamous, in, or or uh, became famous after she reportedly went missing. She was went to the beach and they couldn't find her. And the rumors started that well, she possibly drowned. And so they searched and they searched, and the whole city of Los Angeles was in mourning because Sister Amy just disappeared. Everyone thought she drowned. And about a month later, she was found in Mexico claiming that she had been kidnapped and that they, the, the kidnappers brought her to Mexico because they needed her to do services there and, and heal sick people there. But uh, there were many rumors around that time that she had um, had actually had an affair with somebody and was trying to cover up her tracks and, and all that kind of stuff. And so she created this elaborate theme and scheme of what had happened. I'm not going to cast any judgment on that. I don't know all the details. All I do know is that this court, this those rumors were brought to the court and she was cleared of all those rumors and charges. There weren't enough evidence to suggest that she had an affair or whatever. But all I do know is that she was a very uh, complicated person like all of us. And many times when a complicated person like all of us are complicated, are thrust into the spotlight or are put upon a pedestal, all the flaws and decisions and choices kind of are seen by everybody and can become quite a scrutiny. Um, so, you know, she, even despite all the setbacks and rumors, she continued to minister. And in 1944, she was holding a special service in Oakland, California. And, and she preached a sermon that night on December or September 26th. She preached a sermon and she went to bed and she never woke up. And again, there's some controversy around that. It, it looks as though the history books tell us that she took too much of her medication by mistake and it, it caused her body to he was so worn out and tired. Uh, one history book I was reading said that she preached up to 20 times every week, 20 sermons every single week. 
and that would drain her out and wear her down. And so she went to bed one night after a sermon, took her medication, must have made a mistake, and she never woke up. And what's really interesting, before we move on to the next person, is that her funeral took place in Los Angeles at Los Angeles Temple. And it is still one of the largest funerals ever held in the city of Los Angeles for this Canadian girl who became a Pentecostal pastor and evangelist, who, who became a pioneer and was radical and caused a lot of people to be uncomfortable because she owned a radio station. She started a Bible college. She started a denomination. She started a social program to help feed people when they were hungry. This Pentecostal girl from Canada, Ontario, has still, still today had one of the largest and most well-attended funerals in the history of Los Angeles. People mourn for her. And still today, her work continues on. All right. I spent a lot of time on her. There's She is very fascinating. And there are books and books and books on her. And I think Pastor Julia has some. If you would like to read about Sister Amy Semple McPherson and her complicated life and her powerful ministry, there are lots of books on her. And uh, you could look her up. I still have a few more. Don't go on me yet. I know we're about 45 minutes into this. But don't stop. I still have a few more I want to talk about uh, this evening. So, Ari McAllister, Amy Semple McPherson. The next person I want to speak about is Andrew Harvey Argue, A.H. Argue. And he was a Pentecostal pioneer in Canada. He was a very influential person in the Pentecostal movement in the early days. And he was an influential leader in starting the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada, which is the largest Pentecostal denomination uh, or fellowship of churches in Canada. Um, so he, he was from uh, Western Canada. And after hearing about the revival uh, that happened in Azusa Street and how that revival was pouring out in Chicago, the Holy Spirit was moving in Chicago, he uh, decided to tra he traveled to Chicago in 1906, same year that Ari McAllister went to Los Angeles. He went to Chicago, and there he experienced a powerful experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and he was forever changed. And he went back home to Winnipeg, and he was a very successful businessman. He was a real estate man. He had business. He's, he was very successful. And he, he left all of that behind. He cashed in all of his businesses. He left that life behind because he felt God was calling him and his wife, as you can see there, calling them to be Pentecostal pastors and to share the power of the Holy Spirit with all those who would stop and listen. And uh, he became very successful and, and and his services started out very small in his house and they got so popular that people used to stand on the outside patio, the porch outside his house to listen to the services and to his preaching. And uh, they knew that something needed to change and something needed to happen when one Sunday the patio and the porch actually broke. Uh, so many people were standing on it, it actually collapsed. And so they said, okay, we got to do something. And so he founded a church in Winnipeg called Calvary Temple. And, uh, and this church in Winnipeg for decades was the largest Pentecostal church in Canada in the city of Winnipeg, Calvary Temple. And it, during his time in his life in Winnipeg, it was said by everyone, a lot of people in the city, I can't say everyone, but a lot of people in the city of Winnipeg said this. There are two people you can trust in this city. One is God and one is A.H. Argue. He was a very um, a trustworthy and, and a man of high character and well-respected in the city of Winnipeg and was influential in the spread of the message of the Holy Spirit in Western Canada and in the, all of Canada, really. And he went on to be very a very successful evangelist and a major influencer in the, in the Pentecostal message in our country and a founding member of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. Because what we have to recognize is that over 100 years ago, we never had denominate, Pentecostal denominations like we have today. What was happening is that there would be a Pentecostal church here and a Pentecostal church there and, and, and different places. And, and they were all kind of their own entities and their own things. And, and they desired to be in a fellowship and they needed to help with one another. They needed resources. They needed to come together to help promote the gospel. And so uh, what, what happened is they actually formed these fellowships. And of course, the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada was one of those fellowships that they formed. And so A.H. Argue. 
another influential Canadian Pentecostal and uh, that has made an impact not only in Winnipeg, but has made lasting impact in our country. His sons and his daughters became influential in the Pentecostal movement, and it was absolutely wonderful. His ministry was incredible. Next person I want to talk about, actually it's a couple, not one individual, it's a couple. James and Ellen Hebden. So James and Ellen Hebden were from England, and uh, they were Pentecostal pastors and pioneers based out of Toronto, Ontario. And they were involved in some Christian work in England. But um, after, and, and while in England, they felt that God was calling them to Jamaica to be missionaries. And so they went to Jamaica and it just didn't turn out like they thought it would. And, uh, and so they ended up leaving Jamaica and they went to Toronto, Canada instead. And there they opened a little um, ministry, a little small church. And unfortunately, I couldn't find any pictures of them. But here we see their little church, the storefront church, where my, my mouse is moving along here. That was, it was called the East End Mission. And this was a little small storefront church and they lived in this building. And they also in this building had healing rooms and healing homes where people who were sick could come there and they would pray for them. And many times they might stay there for a week or two weeks, maybe a month until God had healed them. And um, and so they, they weren't Pentecostal in the beginning. They were just Christians desiring to be used by God. They believed in the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit. And uh, in 1906, they came to Toronto in 1904, 1906. They, uh, Ellen Hebden was praying one day and, and she just knew that she was running out of strength. She needed God's strength to keep her going in what they were doing in the ministry. And they just, she just knew that there had to be more for her because what she was doing wasn't, she, she just knew there was more. And so she started praying that the, that the Lord would give her power and give her what, what she needed to, to do this ministry with her husband. And while she was praying, the Lord said to her tongues, as in Acts chapter two, Verse four, the Holy Spirit filled them and they all began to speak in tongues. And she actually said in her prayer, she writes this in her journal. I said, Lord, anything but tongues, anything else. I don't want to be a fanatic. I don't want to speak in tongues. And again, the Lord said tongues. And so she said, OK, God, if that's what you want, your will, your way, if that's what you want, give it to me. Give it to me full measure. And that moment in November of 1906, she was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And spoke in a language that God had given her as the evidence of that sign. As the evidence of that infilling. A month later in December, her husband James experienced the same thing. He experienced the infilling power of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. As a symbol or as a sign that the Holy Spirit gave him the endowment of power like Acts chapter 2. Now this is what's really interesting. This Hebden mission, the East End mission, James and Ellen Hebden. They or had I have Hebden, yeah. Uh, I thought I had the words mixed up there. They had no connection to the Azusa Street revival, they didn't even hear really about this revival. They didn't go there, they didn't have anyone come from there and teach them this. This was Canada's own personal Azusa Street, this was Canada's own personal outpouring separate from Azusa Street. But the mission that was happening here was influential. And uh, and so in nine, this happened in 1906. And through this, they started preaching about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. People were filled with God's power. They started a church on Queen Street. And uh, in, in 1910, uh, the Hebdens felt God calling them from Toronto to North Africa to be missionaries. And so they left everything they knew and followed the spirit where he was calling and went to North Africa. After a couple years in North Africa, unfortunately, James died and Ellen continued to live quite a long life after that. But they were influential in the Pentecostal movement here in Eastern Canada. They were influential in the Pentecostal movement. And it was unique because it was separate and different than Azusa Street. I want to talk about one more person tonight. And uh, if I don't talk about this person, I'll hear lots of comments. Um, in the comment section. So I'm going to take a moment to look at some of the comments. Uh, Gloria Vincent, uh, great information. Listen, I, I'm happy to share 
again, I have these books. And if you're in the Clarenville area and you want to read some of these books, I have them in my office. Very interesting. And again, we're just looking at some Canadian heritage when it comes to the Pentecostal movement as we get ready to celebrate Canada Day. Um, here we see uh, Sarah saying, very interesting. I love history. It's extremely lovely hearing about these faith-driven, God-loving people in their lives. Thank you, Pastor Andrew. Uh, yes, Sarah, living in Newfoundland. So good to have you with us tonight, Sarah. Glad that you're joining with us. Feel free to ask a question or put a thought in here as we go through. And I think some of you watching tonight will be able to put some more comments in on this next individual that was very influential, not only in Canada by her ministry, but especially here in Newfoundland. And that person is none other than the lady named Alice Bell Garrigus. Alice Bell Garrigus was a American school teacher who became the founder of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Newfoundland and Labrador. So the story goes like this. Uh, about a year after receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit in a Pentecostal service, Alice Garrigus was given instructions to start a work in Newfoundland, to start a Pentecostal church and work and mission in Newfoundland. Now, this instruction wasn't given by a bishop or an elder or a pastor or a leader. This instruction was given by God. Just listen to the story. One evening in October 1908, okay, so this is over 100 years ago, over 110 years ago. One evening in October 1908, a lady named Maud Griffith, uh, overcome by the presence of the Holy Spirit, went to speak to Alice Garrigus, went to speak to her friend Alice. She was overcome with the Spirit, felt that God had a message for her. And, 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 and Sister Garrigus, as she writes about this, says that from the moment that Maud walked in to see her, she knew that there was something that God was going to say. She just knew God was going to use this woman to speak into her life. And, uh, and she suspected that this, this woman was going to tell her about what God wanted her to do. And so she started thinking in her mind, well, maybe God is calling me to Asia or Africa or, or somewhere in the United States. Um, but, but as she was kind of sharing this with the woman, the woman said, you're looking too far. You're looking too far. And so this woman was operating in the spiritual gifts of tongues and interpretation. And at one point, the woman said the word Newfoundland, very clearly, very distinctively, Newfoundland. And, uh, and, and in that moment, Sister Garrick is writes in her book and in, in, her, in her diary that, that she was confident. OK, this is what who where God is calling me, Newfoundland. Um, but there was one problem. She didn't know where that was. It took her by surprise. She, if the lady had said New York or the lady said California, or the lady said Mozambique, and she would know where that was. But the lady said Newfoundland. And she said, where's Newfoundland? And actually, it's reported that she actually had to go to a map and look at a map to see where Newfoundland was because she had she had heard about it, but she did not know where it was. Uh, she heard about it as she was one time taking a trip from the United States to Europe. She she passed through the Grand Banks and they talked about Newfoundland on her trip. And but she ne had never been there, and uh, so she felt okay. God very specifically is calling me to Newfoundland through this woman. This God has used this woman to tell me that He's sending me to Newfoundland. So she started to make some preparations. She started to try to figure out what does this mean? How am I going to do this? And she heard that there was a man. Who, who used to work in the lumber camps in Newfoundland in her area. And so she went to visit this man and uh, she kind of asked for a report. What's Newfoundland like and what are the people like? And this is what he said. And she writes about this. The man who worked in the lumber camp said this to her. Newfoundland is no place for a woman to go. And he, and he shared about, and his report wasn't very positive. He shared about how rough it was in the camp and how vulgar the language was and the drinking and all the debauchery and all the things going on. And he said, don't go. It's no place for a woman to go. But she didn't, didn't set her back. She's figured, no, God had called me. And uh, this is what God wants me to do. He wants me to go to Newfoundland for some reason. He wants me to go there and, and start the Pentecostal work and share the full gospel with people there. And so although it was a very bad report from this lumberjack, um, she still decided God is calling me there. So in, in 19, 1910, okay, so 1908, this is when she first heard, heard God call her to Newfoundland. In 1910, she's attending a camp meeting, a special uh, services, 
and she was approached by a lady at the service. And we don't know who that lady was, but um, she was approached by, by this lady. And the lady asked Sister Gary, because she said, I heard God has called you. Where where has God called you again? Where Where is God calling you to go? And so Alice said, he's called me to Newfoundland. To which the woman began to shout and praise God right there, right there. Oh, my goodness. Praise God. And she started to give God glory. She said, this morning I was praying for my people. And she said, the Lord told me your prayer is answered. I have prepared my messenger. And Alice kind of confused by this. She said, well, who are your people? And the woman said, I am from St. John's, Newfoundland. I am from Newfoundland. People in Newfoundland are my people. And I had prayed that God would send someone to them. And God told me in my prayer today that he had prepared someone to go. And the story tells us and the book tells us that they were just so amazed that God had moved on them. And they worshiped God the rest of that day for how he had answered and prepared the way. So in 1910, and I want you to get notice of this. Alice Bell Garrigus, a single woman, a teacher who wasn't young. By the standards of that day, she was 52 years old. She wasn't young by any standard of that day. She left everything she knew along with a, a ministry couple called the Fowlers, Mr. and Mrs. Fowler. And they left the United States and made the journey to Newfoundland. Now, at that time in 1910, not until 1949, Newfoundland wasn't a part of Canada. It was its own separate dominion, British colony. So um, they had to pass customs when they got through Canada. And the story goes that in, in, in Sydney, Nova Scotia, she was going through the customs department. They were getting ready to board the boat to go to Newfoundland. And the custom officer asked her, he said, what is your reason for traveling to Newfoundland? Like a custom officer would say, why are you going there? And she was simply repri replied, I'm going to preach the gospel. And he was kind of taken back by that. He didn't know what to make of it. Here's this woman, 52 years old, lots of gray in her hair, uh, dressed in the way she's dressed. And he said, but you're but you're 52. Is, isn't there a younger person? Couldn't a younger person go and do what you're trying to do? To which she said, you know, I, I thought about that myself. But um, but God called me for this purpose. And if it wasn't God calling me, I, too, would think this was a mistake. So they got their clearance to come in on the boat and they crossed over. And on the end, in the last few days of November 1910, Sister Garrigus and the Fowlers arrived in Port Basque. They got on the train and uh, a pretty amazing story there. They got in there with like second class tickets, just your basic economy ticket. And when they got on the train, the conductor or the uh, of the engineer on the train noticed who they were, the steward there, noticed, who they, noticed something about them and said, listen, you don't deserve to sit back here. He didn't know really who they were. He just noticed that. They, they got it worked in him or prompted him, I guess, and said, you don't deserve to sit here. And he moved him up to first class to go all across the, the, the province. So that was a big deal, an uh, answer to prayer. And um, they, they arrived on December the 1st in St. John's, Newfoundland. They found a place to stay and lay their head in kind of a boarding house. And on that night when they arrived, uh, Alice went up to her bedroom and knelt by her bed and, and her her memoir says this, that she knelt down and she said, Lord, you said Newfoundland and here I am. It's kind of saying, God, I've done my part now. Now you got to do your part. Now you got to show me what to do. So not long after she arrived in Newfoundland in St. John's, uh, she met a contractor. They were trying to find a place to have services, but uh, they couldn't find anywhere suitable. So they met a contractor who said, okay, I can actually build you something. And so they built a little small, what they called a mission. It wasn't a cathedral. It wasn't a big church. It was a sanctuary with a platform and a prayer room on one level and then the living quarters on the second level. And they built that at 207 New Gower Street. And so you can go to St. John's this summer and walk down 207 New Gower Street. It's uh, right there after you get off the Pitts Memorial Drive, right across from... Um, I guess there's a new Hilton hotel down there. And that's where she had the very first Pentecostal church. And she named it the Bethesda Mission. And uh, and she named this church the Bethesda Mission. And then a, a few years later, she started the denomination that she called the Bethesda Pentecostal Assemblies. And which would later become the Pentecostal Assemblies of Newfoundland. 
and then later become the Pentecostal Assemblies of Newfoundland and Labrador. And once Sister Garrigus arrived, she never returned to the United States. She never went back. And she became known as the lady who came. Let me see if I can get this up here now. The lady who came, right? And the lady who stayed. And she was the founder of the Pentecostal work here in Newfoundland. And uh, actually, our church in Clarenville can trace our roots to her and her Pentecostal work. Because uh, her preaching, people in Bishop Falls heard the Pentecostal message. They started a Pentecostal church in the town of Bishop Falls, of which a woman named Dulcie Balsam was working in Bishop Falls at the time, got saved at the Pentecostal church, and got filled with the Holy Spirit, came back to Clarenville and, and, and lived here and felt God was calling her to start a church here. And so she started holding prayer meetings in her house on Balsam Street. And from there, a small Pentecostal church started and it was on Balsam Street. Then it grew a little bit more and went to Leslie Street. And then it grew a little bit more. And now we're here on Trinity Crescent. And uh, and we're growing again and we're looking at doing some expansion to our building. And we've been here now for 70 years, the Pentecostal church in Clarenville for 70 years because of a woman named Alice Bell Garrigus, who felt, felt God was calling her to come and share the gospel with Newfoundland. So. Since the opening, so she had her opening day. So she, she came in 1910, and the very first Sunday that she had was uh, Easter Sunday afternoon in 1911. And I don't know if you can see here. Let me make the screen a little bit bigger. I don't know if you can see my mouse kind of going over the screen. This was the Bethesda Mission. And you can see a lot of them were children and women. And a lot of the early congregation members were children and women. And they had a lasting impact. And since her time, since she started that, the Pentecostal Assemblies has planted lots of churches, over 100 churches, close to 200 churches, um, and have, have raised up hundreds of pastors, have sent missionaries all over the world, and, uh, and have planted churches and have changed this province for, for the good, I believe, for the better, and, and has, has its own school system for a while. And uh, actually had even great impact. The, the famous Newfoundland premier, Joey Smallwood, actually grew up under the influence of the Pentecostal mission, the Bethesda mission in St. John's. He can remember seeing uh, Miss Gar Sister Garrigus when she was a younger woman and his mother was instrumental in, in the church there. And he actually has strong Pentecostal roots, Joey Smallwood. So whether you like Joey or not, I don't know, but he, he had a tremendous impact, tremendous influence in our province and around the world. We have sent missionaries to Asia and Africa, to South America, all around the world. Uh, pastors who were raised in our churches and, and have come through our church and are now preaching all over Canada, the United States, and around our world. Now, it's had its own struggles. It's had its own troubles. Uh, you know, we've had, we've had setbacks and troubles and situations and growing pains, but Newfoundland and Labrador has retained its own unique identity as a Pentecostal work. Uh, we're not the part of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. We're associated with them. We're very close to them. We're close to the Assemblies of God, but we're not them. We are our own thing and our own expression of Pentecostal work. And still today, God is using the Pentecostal Assemblies of Newfoundland and Labrador to shape and change our province. Um, historically, the church in Newfoundland, the Pentecostal church in Newfoundland, from Nain to St. John's, the Port of Bass to St. Anthony and all in between in Labrador City. We've been known for our giving and generosity. We, we are some of the greatest givers in our country when it comes to missions giving. We're known for our passionate worship and praise and for our singing. And we're known around our world for our desire to share the good news of the gospel. And uh, there's so much more I could share on this. Um, in regards to the Pentecostal work in Canada, there's so many more people and so many, especially in Newfoundland. Um, but but let me just give a couple honorable mentions uh, tonight. A couple people I never had a chance to share. We're well over an hour on this. But a couple people that uh, are Canadian and, they're, and they've made an impact on the Pentecostal movement and the world at large. 
Um, and I'm going to have some concluding thoughts after that. Any questions you might have, maybe you can ask them. I might know the answer or maybe some thoughts you can share. Maybe you you have a story of, of uh, maybe you, you have a connection to Sister Garrigus. Who knows? But let me just ke give a couple honorable mentions that I couldn't share tonight. Maybe another video on another night. Uh, first of all, David Maines, Pastor David Maines. Um, he was the founder of, of the 100 Humley Street program and in the in the 60s. And um, actually, it was amazing. In, in the 1950s and 60s, um, the, 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 the Canadian Television Corporation, the governing body, made a decision at that time that they were no longer going to show any one particular denominational program. Um, they weren't going to show just Pentecostals or Baptists or Roman Catholics. They weren't going to just show that. They, so, so David Maines had to be very creative and he did kind of a variety show, a Bible talk, a variety show of things, more of a talk show style that wasn't just strictly Pentecostal. It was all denominations. And that led to his great success. And David Maines has since passed away and now is with the Lord and, and has been a major influence. And even still today, his TV program and Crossroads uh, um, community uh, channel and, and the network there is still strong at both online, digitally and on your TV. Uh, I think about Eugene Vaders, who was the second superintendent of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Newfoundland. He was very instrumental, uh, very, very instrumental in the growth of the Pentecostal movement and uh, both here in uh, Newfoundland and in Canada. I think about a man named Campbell Smith, who uh, who actually married A.H. Argue's daughter, but he was a banker, a successful banker, and uh felt that God was calling him to ministry, left the banking profession, became a pastor and became very influential because he actually served as the president of the Eastern Pentecostal Bible College, not once, but twice, two different times. He served as the president. And of course, Eastern Pentecostal Bible College at that time was probably the premier uh, training institution for pastors and Pentecostal ministry in Canada. And he may have had a major influence on Canadian uh, churches and churches around the world. I think of, um, this is not necessarily a person, but an organization, the Emergency Relief and Development Overseas, ERDO, uh, that program, and of course, also the Canadian Food Grain uh, Program, where they help bring relief to uh, fa famine and natural disasters and issues all over the world. And this is to the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada and the people that work at that and, and support that, especially Child Care Plus. They, they help people all over the world and make amazing impact. I think about in Newfoundland, um, a boat called the Gospel Messenger. It was a boat, the Gospel Messenger, that they used to go to small communities on the coast of Newfoundland and to go to Labrador and to preach the gospel to these places that cars couldn't get to, but they would steam in on the boat. And uh, there's actually a story about how one time the boat broke down outside of a community of St. Lanier Gricket. The boat broke down and the, and the fishermen brought him into the wharf and they had to wait for the boat to get fixed because the engine had broke. And so instead of sitting down and just hoping for the best, they actually started preaching there. And they uh, started praying in the in the fishermen's sheds and the stages, and a, and a and a move of God happened, and a church was planted there, even though it seemed like it was a mistake or a problem. The boat broke down. They actually were there, and they started a church, and that church is still in existence today. And and there are people in our church in Clarenville that are from Saint Leonard Gricket and grew up in the church that was started by the men who came on a broken boat. I also think about a woman named. Uh, Bernice Gerard, who was a founding past, she founded several churches in British Columbia and was the senior pastor of the Pentecostal church, a Pentecostal church in Vancouver for close to 20 years. And, uh, and, she, and she ministered there as a single woman. She worked with another single woman and together they pastored this church. And again, think about this. Today, there are still many churches that don't allow women to preach and be pastors. But at that time, pretty well every church except the Pentecostal churches allowed did not allow women to be pastors or evangelists or, or to be teachers in the church or leaders in the church. But the Pentecostal movement says God has poured out his spirit on all flesh, everyone, men and women. Young and old can be filled with the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. And I also think about um, Pastor H.H. H. Barber, 
who was a Canadian Pentecostal. He became the pastor of Calvary Temple in Winnipeg. Uh, he was there for close to 50 years as the pastor. And he was a, he started his own TV program. And he, he did a lot of unique and creative things to preach the gospel. And had a very major influential ministry here in Canada. So here are just a few, just a little small uh, taste of the Pentecostal history that we have in heritage. And there's so much more that I could share. And I just love this stuff. I love listening to it and watching it and reading about it and learning about it. And uh, I wanted to share that with you tonight as we get ready for our Canada Day and we look at our country of Canada and there's a lot of things we're proud about and some things we, we wish we could turn back time and do things differently. Uh, I'm reminded that Canada has a great heritage, heritage in the Lord. And I'm reminded that God is not finished with the nation of Canada yet. He's not finished with the province of Newfoundland and he is not finished with the town of Clarenville or Calvary Pentecostal Church. He's not done with us yet. There are still greater things for God to do in us and through us. And we need to pray for our country. We need to pray that God would use uh, men and women, young and old, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit to influence change and impact our country for God. I want to give one final thought before we finish up tonight. If you've enjoyed this tonight, put in the comments, really enjoyed this or learned a lot. If you hated it tonight, Put in the comments, I hated this, wish you never done it, <laughs> and I'll see all of it. But one final thought that, that kind of struck me as I was reading and preparing for this and getting the history book ready is this thought. I don't know if you can see it. Let me make the screen a little bit bigger. But here in Los Angeles and here in Newfoundland, when a Pentecostal church was started, it was called a mission. You, it's hard to see not very many good pictures of this building. But this, this church was called Apostolic Faith Gospel Mission. Uh, I can remember my grandfather uh, talking about how when he was growing up, uh, Pentecostal churches were called mission churches. They were, they were mission churches. They weren't necessarily called churches per se, but Pentecostal missions. And... Um, and that thought has struck me because the Pentecostal movement started and was carried by a desire for every Christian to experience Acts chapter 2, verse 4, to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and to give the praise of God and to declare the praises of God in a language they did not know, in tongues, to as a sign of of the Holy Spirit's power and that gift and that promise of tongues and of, of the Holy Spirit's baptism was not just for themselves. It was to be a mission so that they could be witnesses and testify about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sometimes I wish we still had that word mission in our name because as a church, we can get comfortable doing our routine, get comfortable doing our own thing, making sure the lights stay on, making sure we just survive. But in a mission, the goal is to make disciples of Christ, to go out. It, it's, a, it's a focus. There's a goal at hand. And although our church says Calvary Pentecostal, uh, Calvary Pentecostal Church, really we're a Pentecostal mission. And they used to call them mission pastors, mission churches, Pentecostal mission, because it was a focus and goal. We want everyone to encounter the good news of Jesus Christ and have their lives changed by him. He has changed my life and he can change your life as well. And more than that, we want Jesus to baptize you with the power of the Holy Spirit so that you may have victory in this life and that you may receive the power to testify and tell others about him. We are on a mission. It is not time for us to slow down. It is not time for us to step back and think about, well, we like to do this and we like to do that. Our job and our calling is to say, Lord, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to say? Work and move in me, Holy Spirit. And so I want to end with that thought on this Canada, leading up to Canada Day, to reflect upon the rich history and heritage we have 
and uh, and to think about how God has used Canadians in the past and how God is using Canadians in the present and how God is going to use Canadians in the future should Jesus tarry. So let's end tonight our Bible study by praying and asking the Holy Spirit to fill us. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit is a promise and a gift of the Father in which every believer can receive, no matter young or old, man or woman, you can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit today and be filled with His power and have that sign, that evidence that He has come and filled your life with the speaking in tongues. Let's pray together and let's ask the Lord to fill us with His power. Let's pray for our country once again and then we'll get ready to conclude. I'll share a few of your comments here tonight and then we'll finish up. But let's pray. Father, today we thank you for the great heritage we have in you. We thank you for the pioneers and the pastors and the evangelists and the Sunday school teachers and the deacons, God, and and, and all those who have played a part in this Pentecostal movement. Lord, we thank you for the full gospel tonight, that the gospel not only saves us, but heals us and fills us with your power makes us participation and participate uh, and participate in what you want to do in the world today. So Lord, I pray that you tonight would fill us once again with the Holy Spirit's power, that you would stir up within us that fire and desire for your kingdom's cause. Lord, I believe that you are not finished with the Pentecostal movement in Canada. I believe that in Clarenville and in Newfoundland there are greater things yet to come. Lord, we are trusting you for this and know that we cannot do it on our own, but we need your power and we need your Holy Spirit. So, Lord, bless us, fill us tonight. Give us that anointing once again. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I am so glad that you join with us tonight. Got a couple here, a couple of things I want to share. Some people said, uh, really enjoyed this. Thanks, Pastor. You're welcome, Gloria. Tammy and Tom said, this has been very interesting. A lot of great information tonight. Yes, there's going to be a pop quiz on Sunday after church. So make sure you got all your notes down. Lawrence and Kathy said, very interesting. Thank you. Uh, Carolyn, which is my mom. She, my mom's watching tonight. Love this info. Definitely will check out a few of your books when I visit. Uh, I don't know if I can lend you books, mom, because I've seen you. You're a bit hard on books. So we'll see what happens. Uh, Brent tonight has said, uh, this was awesome. Very interesting and informative. Helen Sparks this evening. Thanks, Pastor. Enjoyed your presentation, Bill and Helen. Thanks, Bill and Helen, for watching tonight. Uh, Pastor Hamel, former pastor of the Calvary Church here in Clarenville. Excellent teaching, Pastor. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Pastor Hamel. And I want to thank you publicly, those watching tonight. Uh, I put online a, a couple months ago looking for a couple books that uh, by a Pentecostal uh, theologian and, and scholar, P Dr. Carl Ratz, looking for some books he had. And I, I love reading his books. And many times his books make it into my sermons. And I posted online and Pastor Hamel sent me a message and said, Andrew, I have them in my library. I want to give them to you. And so in my office now, let me see if I can get them. Uh, here we go. Two of the books that Pastor Hamel sent me. And I appreciate it greatly. Um, to Andrew, a younger brother and preacher of the gospel. Pastor David Hamel. So thank you very much, Pastor Hamel, for sharing that from your library. And uh, again, uh, Pentecostal heritage and uh, hoping it to influence today. And uh, good to see you, Sarah. Thank you for joining all the way in England. I know that it's a different time zone for you. And so thanks for joining tonight. And oh, interesting here. Helen Sparks says, my father, I'm, I'm assuming it's Helen, it might be Bill, but my father was saved in the Pentecostal mission in Bay Roberts. The mission was on Mission Road, and that street is still called Mission Road. The very interesting, isn't it, that the idea of the Pentecostal mission, I think we've lost that a little bit in our churches, and uh, don't blame the pastor. Uh, look at ourselves. Look at myself. Look at yourself. We've kind of lost that mission, and um, and so uh, we we got to get back to that, that we're called to be a mission, and I'm so glad that, that our church is regaining that, and I think we really are, and uh, today, uh, Pastor Julia, along with our summer student, went to a local business and picked up 
lots of snacks and food because over the summer, our church is providing snack packs to families who are needing some snacks over the summer. Of course, many families rely upon the school programs for breakfast program and recess programs. Uh, but when summer's here, school is out. And so we want to help provide some snacks for kids over the summer, healthy, good snacks. And we believe this is one way of sharing the gospel. We believe it's one way of doing the work of the ministry that the spirit has empowered us to do. And so they picked up Oh, a bunch of strawberries and bagels and stuff. And what's amazing, God is opening doors and, and businesses are donating items and donating money so that God's gospel can go out in a lunch bag and in a snack pack. And so it's amazing. So thank you to the businesses who are doing that. But I want to give God the glory for opening that door and allowing us to be in mission and on mission and for the mission tonight. And I could talk about this forever. So I got to finish up. It's almost an hour and a half you've been on and your eyes are glazed over and they're hurting and you need to go to bed. But uh, thank you so much for joining tonight. It's been my privilege. I hope in a couple of weeks to have another guest on to do an ideal Bible reader. Hope to do uh, some in-person Bible studies as well again. But I wanted to share tonight just to talk about the fact that we as Canadians have great heritage in the Lord. And we don't need to look back and say, wasn't that awesome only, but say, wasn't that awesome? Look what God can do today and look what he can do tomorrow. And with with this, I'll end. And, and I probably said that three or four times now. But I started tonight's session by talking about a man named Carl Vaders, who was the grandson of Eugene Vaders, a very influential Pentecostal pastor. And he said this at a conference. And I'll never forget it. We don't honor the life and ministry of the pioneers and our forefathers and those who went before us by doing what they did. But we honor them by thinking like they thought. Here we see books published, periodicals, radio, television, any method to share the good news. Today, we can still use some of those items and some of those methods, but the Spirit of God is calling us forward to think like the early Pentecostal pioneers, to find any way and any method to share the gospel. Well, thank you so much for joining tonight. And I hope that this video has blessed you. If you missed the beginning part of this, in a few moments, this video will be uploaded to YouTube and Facebook and you can watch all of it. God bless you. And I hope that you and your family have a happy Canada Day and that you uh, take time to pray for our country. We need it so desperately. Pray for the indigenous people of our country. They are so hurt and broken and needing the Lord to heal them. And, and it's a job that really only he and the Holy Spirit can do. And so let's trust in the Lord today for those needs. And let's love our country, pray for our country, and trust in the Lord. God bless you, and I'll see you next time.